Hello again. So we're going to go through a really, really basic introduction to Inventor. If this video is going slow for you, I have notes in here that have screenshots that will be faster to just go screenshot by screenshot through the notes. Or hopefully you can take this video and change the speed to get through it faster. There's also links in here. I think everybody has this downloaded already. Again, this is only for Windows software. You're not going to be able to download it if you have a Mac unless you go through the boot camp route or you just get a laptop. So um, make sure you have a Windows computer to get this and um, there is, yeah, that boot camp option, but it's it's a pretty good pain to, to get through that. Okay, so for the homework, we're going to have a scribble page like we did before where you're going to explore all of the basic commands. I will do an example. You do not have to do exactly what is in the example, but spend enough time that you feel comfortable using the basic drawing commands, modify tools, extrude. We will go straight from two dimension to three dimension this first week. And the main thing that I would like everybody to do this time around is create a bridge. And I will make a separate video going through this bridge, which will be creating a three dimensional object and taking it one more step where we will actually assign a material to it, assign a force to it, and test it for various different road conditions. Okay, so starting up, when you have this thing loaded, be very careful when you're opening it that you are not in the read-only mode, that you're making it up to the, the full professional version of it. And again, this is a very large program, so you're going to want to make sure that you don't have a lot of other programs up and running. So close down Word, close down PowerPoint, close Excel, close down everything you don't absolutely, absolutely have to have open. And as with AutoCAD, get in the habit of saving your files and saving them often and... <laughs> You'll be making a lot of files this this one, so choose choose file names appropriately and be patient. So you can see how long this thing is taking to open up. And I have an older older computer. This is a school computer, so hopefully yours will go a little bit faster. But I wanted to just walk through from the very very start of um, what the opening screen looks like, how to navigate to some basic tools. You can see it, it's still loading down here. So again, before you start clicking on anything, just be very, very patient. Okay, so we finally have the opening screen. There's four different file types. It'll be very tempting to just click on one of these buttons, but I'm going to show you a different way to open up a template, again, that will have either English, inches, or metric millimeter units. So don't just go with the default part. You want to define your units from the start on this thing. But the idea of how Inventor is organized is you're going to have IPT part files. Each solid nut and bolt is going to have its own file type. And then you're going to take those parts, assemble them together. Drawing is equivalent to layout in AutoCAD. Drawing is where you're going to add dimensions and have your title block and have something that you would hand to your machine shop. The presentation, and we'll spend a little bit of time going through this, it's kind of fun. You can make a really nice rendered movie. So choose a background. You could have it in the Andes Mountains or a chemistry lab and you adjust lighting and material types and surfaces and you make kind of a really nice animation and um, you can do exploded views and show how all the different parts come together. So this is more of a graphical um, presentation versus drawing is just the straight 
orthographic views that we've been working on from the workbooks that show very clearly the dimensions and tolerances and any notes that that your your machine shop just kind of this the engineering industry standard versus more of an artistic rendition okay and these are in order of how you'll use them so first you make parts then you assemble those parts together then you put dimensions on it and create your drawing and you can also do presentations okay i'm not going to click on parts i'm going to go to new and this route is going to get me to the templates so just like autocad had templates inventor also has templates you might need to open up this menu to see the different options you have in here okay so under english templates and they have templates for parts assemblies drawings presentations i'm going to just start with the basic standard inch so this means when I type in one, that would be one inch versus if I click on metric template. And again, for this one, I would use the standard millimeter template. So if I type in one, that would be equivalent to one millimeter. And this, you can always rescale what you've drawn, but it's just so much easier to start with one of the standard templates rather than having to scale and try and figure out, especially if you're going to 3D print or use this in a CNC, that it takes those numbers and it literally interprets them to be one inch or one millimeter and it will make it to that size. So, so draw it to scale to the size it's supposed to be and make sure your units are defined right from, from the start so that you don't have to go back and rescale and, and mess with that. Okay, so now we find ourselves in the opening screen. Before we jump in and start drawing, let's go ahead and explore all the file types. So again, I can create another new file right here. I can open previous files that I had. One of the big questions, can I open AutoCAD DWG files into Inventor? And there are two different ways to do this. One is if you just want to view it, and this is just a very fast and easy way to open something up. The other does actually, and this is this is new, it, it wasn't, <laughs> I'm very, very excited to see that you can actually now turn a DWG 3D object into a inventor IPT file, which is very exciting. Now, this option, there's a few things that you have to be very careful how you're importing it, and you can't just rely on the defaults, but um, I have screenshots of this in the notes if you're interested in importing one of your previous um, worksheets that you've done, but this is very, very exciting. So, so this is where you can open files, save, basic save you can have actually multiple files open your file tabs will show up right down here at the left hand side and often you're going back and forth between different parts to make sure those parts fit with one another well so you can save all of the files that are showing up down here as tabs or just one if you want to make backup files that's going to be under your save as export so let's say you have a friend that doesn't have CAD loaded on their computer, but you still want to share these files with them. So you can turn it into a PDF file. Anybody can open a PDF. There's this really cool 3D PDF file that you can actually rotate three-dimensional objects in PDF. You have to have Adobe to open these 3D files up though. So not everybody will be able to open them as opposed to just the straight normal PDF file. You can export this into an AutoCAD file. It's going to have a little bit of differences because Inventor does not have layers. It has a little bit different way that it organizes information. So it will be just a single solid piece that will get imported without all of your settings and stuff, but, but you can do it. So that's great. Um, you can print. This is where you can create files for 3D printing, and it wants to send you to a print service like 
Kinko's or something. But this is, yeah, so this is where you're going to print to 3D, like STLs versus print to a two-dimensional, just regular piece of paper printing. Eye properties, and this is where I see who created what file. <laughs> so all of these are stamped based on who created it, what date it was created, what computer it was created on. It will keep track of every modification that was done to something. So just keep in mind, just like I can tell if someone plagiarized their essay by looking up you know, a paragraph of words, if those words are the same, I can tell if someone plagiarized their inventor file because all of the dimensions are the same and the order of the sketches and the there's a whole fingerprint on everything that is is really good for intellectual property protection. So it's it's nice to have this eye property. But if you're signed into a computer that you don't actually own, so it's not your name popping up on here as being the creator, you might want to go have a look at this and make sure that it's <laughs> it's connecting the author to what is actually being created in there. Okay. So that is all under this file tab. Coming across the top, our sketching tools we will use. Usually you start in two dimensions and then extrude into three dimensions. <clears throat> you can actually create three-dimensional sketches. They tend to be very difficult to create. I, I much prefer that starting with a two-dimensional sketch, but everyone has their own preferences. So try out whatever you would like to try out. Annotate tools, very similar to what you had in AutoCAD. Usually we'll just use these when we're creating the IDW files, like the layout and the dimensions and not actually in the part space. But if you want to just kind of keep track of dimensions, they'll, they'll sort of come up anyways. Um, inspect, you can measure things. That comes in very handy. You can look at angles under tools. This is where you can have fun with colors and and changing the, um, so again, if you're squinting at your screen, if the text is too small, if, you, if changing the color scheme is gonna help, that's all going to be right here under application options and document settings. Um, there's no command line. There's no command line in Inventor. And I think by default, the command prompt does not show up. But as you're starting, it'll probably be a good idea for you to come over here to application options and turn on this command prompt. And that will tell you it's it's almost like the um but it's similar to autocad where it says place the center of the circle define your diameter it'll tell you each little step of the way of what information it's needing from you so <clears throat> so turn these on or if it's driving you nuts you can come back here and, and turn it off if that's not being helpful to you but um yeah, come come through here and you can adjust the display and the colors and, and really make sure those ergonomic issues are you're not squinting and and you're not going to because you'll spend a lot of time staring at this screen. So that's where all of those guys are. Let's see. You can manage components. We'll get into this a little bit later. View. You remember this, these different visual styles, so wireframe, shaded realistic, again, very similar to what you saw in, in AutoCAD. You can have fun playing around with shadows and ground planes and different textures and all kinds of stuff. Okay, so we'll do a stress analysis when we get to the bridge. That's pretty much all of the, you'll, you'll recognize a lot of these three-dimensional commands so extrude revolve sweep loft there's that helix command you can make holes in something fillet shell here's all your modify tools so split thicken i'll have an example with threaded fasteners that is a much better way to do it in inventor than in um, autocad it's actually just a picture 
which reduces the memory of the file rather than actually having a helix and, and making the, the actual threads. It has the standard threads in here. This is, instead of moving your user coordinate system around, you will create two-dimensional planes to draw on. And this is actually, in my opinion, a lot easier than moving the user coordinate system around. So you can create surfaces that are parallel to a point, a midpoint. And again, for all of these tools, just leave your cursor over it for a little bit. It'll give you a description of how to use it. And there's, there's more help online. You can create rectangular and circular arrays, mirror under the sketch tools. So again, there's a lot of different ways that you can define a circle, whether you want the center and the diameter, or you want that circle to be connected to a few different sides, or if you want to create an ellipse. And all of these, just leave your cursor around it. It says, number one, click here, number two, then click here. So several different ways to draw an arc, a rectangle. I like to use the center point, use the origin of your coordinate system, and that will make future assemblies a lot easier if you use your standard coordinate system. You can fill it, chamfer edge, add text, Points are sometimes nice for reference. Okay, so let's go ahead and start drawing. So I'm going to say start a two-dimensional sketch. And it brings up a three-dimensional coordinate system. If you come over here to the origin on this left-hand side, it will show you the orientation of those planes. And I have this in the notes. Let me just show you the notes real quick. So these guys, and this is, I'm kind of walking through all of these in the notes. You can see this is the importing a, a DWG AutoCAD file into Inventor. You can see what that looks like and all the little steps for actually turning it into a usable IPT file. Okay, for this one, the orientation of your coordinate system and make sure you really orient yourself before you start drawing something. So here's your view cube, top, front, right view. The top view is looking down at the X, Z plane. And I think in most math books and physics books, this is how your coordinates are oriented. With X and Y, Y is going up and then X and Z is your ground plane. And over here at the origin, it will tell you like XZ plane and it's pointing right here. You can even highlight the axes over here, but this is, this is the orientation right here. And you also have a little coordinate system down here. Sometimes you rotate the object and then you forget what's up and what's down. So come over here, green is Y, red is X and blue is Z. So look at your coordinate system and kind of orient yourself and remember how that corresponds to your view cube too. This will be very helpful in the future, doing IDWs, adding dimensions, making sure that you have the front view as a front view on your, on your orthographic projection. Skimming down through the notes, this goes through drawing, different ways to use your mouse. So how to pan and rotate and center zoom and select things. So make sure you have a good mouse. You're not using that little pad on a <laughs> laptop or something. Here's again, user interface. So if your view cube is not showing up or your nav bar is not showing up, you can cycle through making the ribbon buttons large or small. There's also um, these little shortcuts. This is kind of nice. So if you don't want to use buttons, if you you really enjoy using shortcuts for everything, this is a really good library for, for different shortcuts for everything. Okay, let's go ahead and I'm going to walk through this example. It's a little bit challenging, but it's also very educational. 
So you do not have to do this for your scribble page. You can pick a different worksheet if you want. But if you do this one, you'll be pretty solid on it by the end and it will probably save you time in the long run. So it will have this dark gray base a second part, this light gray, is actually a different file. And then these threaded fasteners, that's another file. And then I'm going to take these three different pieces. These are both the same from the same file and assemble them together. So if you make it through the entire thing, you'll see how to create specific shapes, how to use constraints and dimensions. How to assemble things together and we'll start looking at some of the part libraries that Inventor has built in. So, so this threaded faster is going to be a lot easier to make in this program than it was in AutoCAD. We're not using the helix command. We're actually going to reach into a library and pick standard thread types out of that library. Okay, so starting, I'm actually going to start on the top, on the top plane here, and I, you just click on whatever sheet you want to start sketching on. Now it has things turned sideways here. You can see my coordinate system is kind of sideways, so I'm going to hit an arrow and orient myself so that I'm looking straight down at the top of this. So my x-axis is going to the right, z-axis is going forward. And what I'm going to draw first is this base plate. So curved edges, I have some holes in this, but it's all gonna start with a two-dimensional shape. I'm going to start with a rectangle and work from there. And the rectangle I'm choosing is center to corner. It's going to be a lot easier to assemble parts in the future if each of your parts is centered at the origin of your user coordinate system. You can actually use the x, y, x, z, the planes on your origin to snap parts together. So this is just one of those tricks that if you know from the start, it'll save you time in the future to actually use the center point. Now, you could turn the snaps on and off for AutoCAD. In Inventor, they are always on. So <laughs> it, look for the snaps and it, it's letting me connect this right there to the center point. And as I draw it, You'll notice there's a few dimensions popping up. The one that's highlighted, I can type in a number right now to define what that is. And you'll notice the color change of this line. So the different thing for this one is you're gonna actually change the dimensions as you draw the thing. So I drew a rectangle if you want to see that one more time, center point to corner, I defined this as I was drawing it. And then the other side, I clicked on the line and that let me define the dimension. And as you define the dimension, it actually changes the shape and it makes it that length. So in AutoCAD dimensioning, that was the last thing you did in layouts for Inventor you dimension as you draw the thing. And the color of the line will tell you if it has a dimension or a constraint defined. So because these lines are all black now, that means that they are kind of set in stone, their dimensions are set, you've defined everything. That's This is gonna be a new thing to get used to. Constraints are also gonna be a new thing for you to try and get used to. This next object, I'm actually going to start it way over here. If I'm anywhere close to this, it's going to try and start snapping it to things, whether it's even at the side. See how it's trying to snap it to the same height? I'm going to actually pull it all the way out so that it's not snapped to every, anything and walk through how these constraint works. Okay, so here's a circle. I'm going to define the diameter as 0.625. 
and you'll notice the color of the line is now purple because it's just floating around in the air. It's not snapped to the center. The, di the diameter is defined, but everything else, it's, it's just kind of floating in outer space. It's not attached to anything. What I want to do is I want to put this circle at the edge and I'm going to make, if I pull those notes up again, I'm going to make just kind of this circle that's coming out of the edge here is what I'm after. So what I'm going to do is first I'm going to take and snap the center of the circle to the side of my rectangle. So I clicked on this constraint and you can see it says select the first curve or point and I'm actually going to select the point, the center point of my circle, and now it says select second curve or point, and I'm going to select the side of my rectangle. You can hit escape to get out of that. It keeps trying to constrain, constrain until you hit, hit escape. And I'm then going to, so I can still move this around but now it's constrained to only be along this line. So, so it's gonna be here along this line. We have limited degrees of freedom. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and drag this thing so that it's underneath this top line and I'm gonna do my second constraint. So I'm gonna take this and I'm going to make this circle tangent to that upper line. Okay, so I'm going to say select first curve, circle, select rectangle, select, and it pops up. One thing to note, the circle was moving around, the rectangle was not moving. Make sure that what you do not want to move has black lines. Black lines say it's, it's in place, it's not moving. If you try and constrain two objects and the wrong object moves, you can also come up here and lock shapes into place. So getting used to using these constraints, I think this is going to be the most frustrating part of all of this to start with. But once you get used to it, you're going to love it because it's <laughs> you can get very fast at getting things at just the right locations and it's you want to start with, with some kind of a nice base that you can attach everything else to, but then you can constrain things to be tangent, to be parallel, to two lines parallel or perpendicular to one another. You can have symmetrical constraints to make sure nothing is lopsided. Okay, so there is our first circle. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in using your mouse scroll button. If you hit control and push on the button, you can pan. If you hit shift and push on your mouse button, you can rotate. So again, control to pan, shift to rotate. Zoom to zoom extents. You can also use your view cube, so get used to, to using your mouse. I'm going to go ahead and put another circle, and this time I'm going to let it just snap to the center of that first circle. You can see my cursor is going to turn from yellow to green when it's snapped on, and this one is 0 0.325 inches in diameter. Okay, one corner down, three more to go. For these next ones, let's go ahead and try the mirror command. So before you use anything, go ahead and look at the description. This one is going to need a line that we're going to mirror our circles around. There are a couple different ways to draw lines on here. One is a line that's actually used for extrusion. One is a construction line. And what we want is a construction line. And they really, really hide this little button up here. So this, this red guy, this will make a construction line, a dotted line that will not mess up any of our extrusions. And in this case, it will just be used for the mirror command. So I'm going to start up the line command, but then I'm also going to select construction. 
And I will go ahead and allow this to snap to the center point. And in this case, the center point is going to be right on top of our X and our Z axis. So it's going to be a little bit hard to see these guys, but there is now a construction line. If you want to change a line from being construction or not, you can just select the line and make it solid, or you can select the line and then turn it back into a construction line. But this little hidden tool up here is going to be very, very important to learn how to use. Okay, so there's our, our mirror line, and now I have what I need to start up my mirror command. So clicking on this and it opens up this new little thing. So first I'm going to select the objects I want to mirror and I can select multiple things all at the same time. I don't have to do this one circle. So I've, I've selected both circles and then next I'm going to go ahead and click on this little arrow mirror line and I can then select my mirror line. Okay, if I go ahead and apply, it gives me a preview showing me what it's going to look like. One more step, I'm going to click done. Okay, so there is one of these. Let's try it one more time. And this time I'm going to mirror circle, circle, left click, left click. And for my mirror line, I will use the center mirror line apply, check out my preview. You can see it's automatically added a few constraints here. This is the symmetric constraint that it has added. So these are symmetrical now around my Z axis. So I'll go ahead and hit done. And now I have these guys in all four corners. One more circle to draw, and this is going to finish off the curved edges over here. Now, rather than trying to snap it into place, I'm going to grab this at the center. And you can imagine how hard this would be if I didn't have that nice center point there. And I'm just going to make it a random size. So you can see that this line is purple. Let me make sure that that's not a construction line. It's not black. So, so the color tells me it's not defined. And that means that I can actually use this guy to constrain. So I'm going to say select the first curve and then I'm going to constrain it down so that it's, it's tangent over here to the edge. Okay, the last piece, we're going to go ahead and grab our modify tools. And I will go ahead and trim whatever I draw a line through. That will get rid of that line segment. So I'll go ahead and just draw a line through all of these guys. And this is what we want in the end. So be very careful. Think through what to keep, what not to keep. And just kind of draw through those crossings of everything we're going to get rid of. So hopefully this has given you a chance to see some of the basic drawing tools. A lot of this should look very familiar from, from the tools we used in, in AutoCAD. And there we have it, our two-dimensional sketch. Before I exit out of this, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that all of these line segments are joined together. So if I right-click on this, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say close loop. In order to extrude, all of the little corners have to be perfectly lined up. So we're going to just walk around this thing and just keep selecting curves until everything is connected.
So it kind of gives you some instructions here to start out with. So I'll go ahead and I will select the next curve. And now I will select this next curve and just keep walking around until I get to this happy message. The loop has been successfully closed. Until you get this message, it will not allow you to extrude. So I'll say OK. Oh, I have one more line to get rid of there. And then I'll go back and finish my sketch. All of your sketches show up over here on the left hand side. If you ever want to come back and edit that sketch again, you can always just click on where the sketch is over here and you can change it around and update it. So this is how Inventor is organized is by sketches and extrusions. So here's our extrusions now that everything is closed and joined. I will select inside that closed area. I can push it up, I can push it down, I can extrude symmetrically around it, which is very nice. And right here, this is where we will state our distance. So I'll go ahead and say OK. Underneath my extrusion on the left here, that sketch is still under there. And again, I can always double click on it, reopen it, change things around. I can also make it visual. So if I come over here and I select visibility, that will let me see all of my dimensions or I can right click and turn that visibility off to get a cleaner look to everything. Okay, for this next layer, rather than starting the sketch on one of our origin planes, you can start a sketch using your own working plane over here, <clears throat> or you can start a 2D sketch by just clicking on the plane that you want to sketch on. So that's very nice and easy rather than moving user coordinate system. Another thing we can do is project the previous geometry up to give us kind of a starting area to snap to. And before I use that project geometry, I'm going to go ahead and turn my construction lines on so that all of the projected geometry lines are construction lines and that will just make it easier in the future. So I have got construction and now I'm going to click on the plane and it is giving me construction lines over where my previous circles were, center points, and that'll just make everything easier. Okay, so here we go. Turning the construction line off again, I'll start drawing in some circles. And you can see I can easily snap. It's probably going to be easier this time around to just draw circles than to use the mirror command because I have these points that I can easily snap to. You can even come down here and it will, you can get extension lines off of things. So once that base place is in place, the rest of it should be pretty quick to, to snap to. Okay, using my trim tool again. And one last step before we finish that sketch and that is to make all make sure everything is joined together. So I'm going to go ahead and walk around making sure that everything is is connected 
this is where you can get into a little bit of trouble of construction lines versus I'm going to go ahead and see if this is this is okay to extrude. Oh, it did. It made it through. Okay, and this extrusion height is going to be 0.325 inches. You can always if you if you get an extrusion height in Rome, you can always double click on it and it will bring that up to um, to either redefine what that length was or if you want to get rid of it you can go ahead and choose delete and you can either delete the sketches and the extrusion or just the extrusion I'll go ahead and cancel that out but everything over here that you've created you can bring those sketches back up you can modify extrusion so it's a really nice way to to organize things and makes it very easy to to go through and modify and fix if you have mistakes starting the next sketch and this is just going to be a circle with a diameter of 1.875 it should snap right to the edge here and we'll extrude this up as well let's see that extrudes up the same amount 0.325 this next little piece is going to be a little bit tricky again there's notes on all of this if, if that helps to see screenshots. Okay, our circles are going to be 0 0.8125 and another circle at 1.125. Let's go ahead and use project geometry. I'm bringing this out as a construction line turning construction line off and actually let's see if we can just get a um, center point here so if I get this center point you can also use the constraints to get that in place my next circle I need to be centered in between these guys. So again, if you hover over the edge, it will then allow you to, to grab that center point. And this circle, making sure it's not a construction line, this will be 0 0.19 in diameter. A little bit odd, but that was on the worksheet. That was tricky enough that I'm going to go ahead and create a mirror line and use symmetry for this guy. Escape again will get you out of something once it's started. So I'm going to select these two circles, mirror line, apply done and the next piece we're going to use the constraints now I see that this one is purple so I'm going to go ahead and lock this in place so I'll lock the center point And I'll make sure that that dimension is set in place. Because remember, if I try to um, if I try to use these and these are not black, then they'll get all moved out of shape. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start up a line command. And I'm going to try and start this line that it's, it's not actually connecting to anything. So I'm going to move it way off 
the page over here and make sure that it's not trying to snap to anything, that it's, it's purely free. So I have black circles here that are locked in place and a purple line out here that, that can move around. And I'm going to go ahead and constrain it first to this outer circle and then to this inner circle. That's a, it's a little bit tricky how that comes together. And once I get that, I'll go ahead and use the mirror command to mirror this around the center line. And I'll make another center line. Looks like I have a center line right there that I can use. So I'll go ahead and mirror those two one more time. So this might be a little bit tricky to do, but you'll get really good at using mirror lines and using the constraints after doing this. Okay, trimming this stuff all out afterwards. And what we're after is kind of this, this gasket that's going to sit at the top of this. So that was only, I could almost have done that with a fillet edge, but, but this will work. A lot to trim out here. So trim, trim. The more familiar you are with what you're drawing, the faster this will go. So sketching it out first goes a long way. And you can always edit undo if you accidentally get rid of something you didn't mean to. OK, escape to get out of trim and join all of these guys together. And extrude it. This one comes up 0.375. OK, there is your base is finished. Just a couple holes to drill out, and I'm going to actually do this from the base. So I'll have a sketch at the bottom here. I'm going to create a circle with diameter of 1.64. For this one, so we had extrude, press, pull, subtract, and in Inventor, if you push something up into a solid, it will automatically subtract it in there. So we're going to push this up all the way through the base, and I'm going to say 0 0.4 for this extrusion. And one more circle in the middle. And this has a diameter of 0 0.8125. And we will push this up through the whole thing. So I can actually overshoot that if I want. Kind of get that nice preview in there, make sure it's where it's supposed to be before I say OK. OK, so now we have this, this fitting finished up. And again, you can see each of the extrusions and each of the sketches underneath those. If you have a ton of extrusions and you want to name them something more descriptive so that it's easier just to, to navigate and remember what is what in here, if you just left click on here, it will allow you to edit that name. So we could call this like a gasket or something instead of an extrusion. And then when we're looking through all of these pieces, then it'll be easier to find that sketch again. OK, this is the first piece. I'm going to go ahead and save it. And if you want to keep going, thanks for making it this far. I'm going to make another little gasket that's going to sit right on top of this, and then I'll make some threaded fasteners.
the very end of this will be the assembly. So this is kind of a little bit more advanced to using assemblies instead of parts, but if you want to keep going, that would be great. We'll do assemblies for sure next week in more detail. So I'm going to go ahead and start up a new file, making sure that I'm grabbing the right template again. And if you have multiple files open, those are going to show up on the bottom of your screen as little tabs. And before I forget, let me go ahead and save this guy. So keep everything in some good folder. So I'm going to call this a gasket. And we're saving it as an IPT inventor parts file. And this is where it's kind of nice to start going back and forth between two different files. So I'm going to come up and reopen that sketch that I made for the gasket. Just double click on it and you can reopen it. And we've got this copy command. So I'll go ahead and select. And I'm going to copy this onto my base board with a base point. So now it is on my on my clipboard. This is the clipboard is needed when you're going between different files. And then for here, I'll go ahead and start up a 2D sketch. And I'm again going to use kind of the top view here. I don't know why it always twists it around. So retwist it. So top side up, control V is the shortcut to plant that sketch down. So control C, or I use my copy onto a clipboard and control V, I'll finish that sketch. And now I've got a second file that has just a just a gasket on there. So two two different files that I can then assemble together in an assembly. One more file that I'm going to make here and that will be for my threaded fastener. So once again I'm going to go ahead open up a new file, make sure I have the same template selected. So here's part three, and I'll call this my threaded fastener. So we're going to make a um, socket cap screw. And if you remember the dimensions that were a little bit strange on that gasket, the 0 0.19, you think, oh, why not 0.25 or something? These, this is actually a standard screw size is where that 0.19 comes from. So we'll we'll go ahead and, and start a sketch. And similar to AutoCAD, we're going to begin this with a cylinder. So we'll have this so that it can fit into that gasket that we created. That's pretty small. <laughs> Okay, here we go. We're going to extrude this up half an inch. And let's go ahead and, and put a cap on it. So we'll make another circle here. And this will be a nice standard 0 0.25. And we'll go ahead and extrude this up. like two inches. Now in CAD, what we did was a helix command with subtract and it was a huge file and it might have crashed your computer. For this time around, we're going to, to use their, their libraries. So we're going to select a face. That's where we're going to put the thread on here. And it actually automatically found this for us. It says, oh, this your cylinder has a diameter of 0.19. So we're going to give it this standard number 10 screw thread. 
and you can choose different classes, right-handed versus left-handed. This is a real good security measure. If you don't want kids unscrewing everything, just make it left-handed and they won't figure out how to undo it. <laughs> so anyways, here's right-handed screw and that was 0.5 high. If you want, you can, you don't have to make it the entire thing. So I'll just say, okay. And what this is, it hasn't actually, if you zoom in on it, it's not actually carving out the threads on this thing. It's just an image that it's wrapping around, but it makes it a much nicer um, file size. Those, like actually carving out all of those little teeny, teeny threads makes it a very complex shape. And if you have a whole bunch of fasteners that you're putting on something that can make it a a huge file that will, you know, especially if you have a bunch of, of fasteners on there. So this will be quite a lot better than than what we had in CAD and using those um, using those pre-made files are kind of they're kind of nice. Okay, so we'll go ahead and and punch in a, a little Get an Allen wrench for the top there and save this. So now what we have is we have our base, we have a gasket, and we have some threaded fasteners to hook the whole thing together. So this new piece that I'm going to open up is now in, rather than creating a new part, we're going to create an assembly to put everything together. So I'll go ahead and open up an assembly file next and we're gonna pull these previous files in and constrain them and assemble them all together. And again, this is a little bit advanced. You don't have to do this this first week, but just to see where all of this is going. So now I have my assembly file as well as my parts that I'm going to assemble together. And again, I'm going to go ahead and get in the habit of before you do anything, just save it. You don't want to get all the way there and it's not saved. So I'll just call that gasket assembly. And what we're going to do is we're going to place all these these parts in here. You have to have all of the files together to open the assembly. The assembly file will not work unless you also have all of those IPTs. So when you're turning these things in, don't just turn in the assembly, turn in your IPT files as well as the assembly. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and say place components. And these were in my 1304. So here's some of these pieces. I'm going to go ahead and, and put this down. So I need one of those. You can keep clicking and have multiple of the same piece, but I only need one of those. Here's my gasket. So I'll place that on there. Hit escape once you're done. And then for the last piece, and for these, I need two of them. Okay, this is where things start to get tricky. So right now, everything is just kind of floating around in outer space. You can come over here, and it's maybe a good idea to turn on degrees of freedom. So this will show you which way these parts can move. And rather than just attaching them to one another, I like to choose one piece as the base that I'm going to ground in place and then attach everything else to my grounded piece. And for my grounded piece, I like to use the coordinate system for the assembly. So each part has its own coordinate system and the assembly also has its own coordinate system. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to take my, my base and I'm going to use the coordinate system of the base 
to snap to the coordinate system of the assembly. And I will do that using my constrain command under assemble here. So constrain, and this will be plane to plane. I can offset the distance or I can leave that offset as zero. And I'm gonna go ahead and take the XZ plane of my base and constrain it to the XZ plane of the assembly. If it pops to the wrong direction, just turn it around right over here. After each constraint, I'm gonna say, okay, and then just move it around to tell. Now, look at the degrees of freedom. So I don't have this third arrow coming up and I'm also not able to rotate it. So I've gone from six degrees of freedom, three translation, three rotation, to only one, two, three degrees of freedom. And it's if I move it around like this, it doesn't look like it's actually stuck to anything. You have to get the view right, and then you realize what the thing is constrained to. So. So move your view cube around with each constraint that you add and just make sure that it is getting attached in the way that, that you think it should be getting attached. And again, turn on your degrees of freedom so that you can see what can move and what cannot move. Underneath each part, it's going to have each of its constraints. So right over here, you can change offset distances. You can temporarily turn it off and then back on, or you can delete that constraint and then restart it in the future if you need to. Okay, so getting back to, to kind of that Front right view, I'm going to go ahead and continue constraining these planes together. So this time, let's go ahead, see how it kind of highlights. Let's try the YZ plane to the YZ plane and see if that will, if that will work. You might have to, to try these a couple times before, before it works. Okay, so fly. And before adding another constraint, again, I'm going to just kind of move things around. So right now, I'm still constrained to move along the floor, but now I only have one degree of freedom. Now this last degree of freedom is the trickiest to get constrained. I'm guessing that if I attempt to, to grab this last, this last center point, that it's going to tell me I'm not able to constrain x, y to x, y. If it fights you, try a line or a point instead of the entire plane. But it looks like, oh, it looks like I lucked out this time and it's actually in place. So, so you can see the bolt and my other pieces still have all of their degrees of freedom, but now this guy is locked in place and is cannot be moved. So I'm going to go ahead and turn these visibilities off just to kind of declutter things and know that I have one piece on there at least that is is not going to go anywhere. And that's that's where you start these assemblies is pick something and I'll also go ahead and ground it. Grounding it automatically locks it in place, but I like to lock it in place centered on the assembly origin. And this will 
be nice in the future when you're creating drawings and presentations and it's just a little bit more organized and um, clear and easy to work with when you have it centered on that assembly. Okay, for the next piece, let's go ahead and constrain this. So I'm going to go ahead and line up the holes. There's two different ways to do these holes. I can either click on the center point or the center axis. To get the point, then I'm going to grab the edge. If I move from the edge to the curved surface, the curved surface will highlight the axis. And I don't want just a point, I want the entire axis on there. So I'm going to click the curved surface, and then I'm going to click not the edge, not a point, but a curved surface. So what that will do is I will then have this top piece, if I can grab it, that it is now aligned with just the axis. So that just that axis will line up. And again, you're going to have to kind of move the orientation around so that you can see what is actually connected to what. And, and for each of these, again, that that constraint is going to show up and it will even highlight both halves of it. So if you have two pieces that are stuck together, so this is mate three and this is mate three, you can kind of find what is connected to what in here. But, but take this one, one piece at a time and move things around and make sure it's connected how you think it is. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and grab this hole and constrain it to this hole. So now I should have one degree of freedom left that I can only move it now straight up and down. And the last constraint to move this into place, I'm going to grab the base of this and I'm going to place that on the surface of this apply. So I, now I have that top piece is in place. Okay, we have some threaded fasteners, so let's go ahead and put these guys in where they need to go in. So we've got this into this hole. Oh, he went right in. Apply. And one more. Let's see, it looks like that one did not go in. So I'll show you how to how to delete it. So this is my threaded fastener one. You see how I, if I click on it on the screen, it highlights over here. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that insert and try that one more time. And some of these it will take it will take a couple times to get those in here right. Okay, that looks like that's right. Apply. So you can see these can't move up and down. The only degree of freedom they have left is rotational. So that is your assembly, where you take all of the parts and you can strain them together to one another into an assembly. Okay, we've come this far. Let's go ahead and just have some fun with it. Boy, I should have had those shadows turned on the whole thing, huh? That makes it look quite a bit better. Those, if you do want to play around with your appearance, so there's a whole library of, of different colors and, 
and textures. We'll go through a finite element analysis where we actually assign the thing to specific um, to be a material. So this is just the color of it. It's not actually changing the weight of it, and it will calculate like the center of mass. So you just you select what you want, and then you say assign material. And then you can see that, that the color has changed a bit on there. So if I select this and say assign to selection, I guess that didn't change it too much. To select multiple things, just hold down your shift key. OK, so that's not too great. Let's go ahead and open up a new file. And we'll walk through the presentation if, you, if you're curious about those. The presentation has to present something. So you can select a um, assembly now or pull one in after you create it. I'll go ahead and, and pull that model in now. Oh, that yellow color is showing up much better. And what you have here is you have a story where all of your files are still open in here. So you can go back and forth to the parts and the assembly. And now here is your presentation. So what we're going to do here is actually create a movie. And we can, let's see, what's a good starting view? Is that a good? I'll go ahead and take a snapshot for that view. And let me pull this up. And I'm going to pull this over and maybe take another snapshot here. Capture camera. See this little blue guy that just showed up? Maybe we'll walk around it. So I'll have another capture angle here. And maybe we'll go to a new viewpoint, capture camera. OK, all these little blue guys. And I can stretch them out, make one longer than another. So these are movable. And this is a timeline on here. I don't know if you've worked with any video editing software, but um, this got a major upgrade in, I think it was 2016, that made this so much nicer and easier. So all of the little orientations you can see as I'm playing this, you can change the timing on it, the location of it, click on it and delete it or move it around however you want. Very, very nice. As well as capturing the camera, you can also take this apart and create kind of an exploded view of it. And that is tweaking components. So I'm going to go ahead and grab these two guys and I can move them forward or sideways so just pull on the arrow direction and I'll move them both up an inch and that has now opened up kind of this new storyboard if you're not seeing the storyboard adjust these so that you can you can see what's happening here and again you can move these around to to get the timing on it right so we have our different camera angles and now we're starting to take this thing apart okay one more thing to take apart so I'm going to pull this over here and then we'll go ahead and tweak this guy and I'll move it down I'll just keep everything negative an inch this time so anyways, it's, it's really nice. You can, you can change the, the camera angles. Maybe for this one, we'll, we'll somehow rotate it around as we're doing that. So it's, yeah, before you had to kind of do it from scratch and get the timing right and everything. You, you had no storyboard to adjust anything or change the timings. And, and now you just click on it and drag. And you can see exactly how how it's creating it. So anyways, once you're um, done with this, you can go ahead and, and publish your video to whatever format you want. And it'll save it 
in your documents folder. So you've got WMV files or AVI. I'm not going to do that now, but that's the that's the presentation. And then the final piece of this would be the, the IDWs. I'll do a whole unit on, on the IDWs for creating the, um, the drawing. These are very similar to the, to the layout. Okay, that's it. Thanks for, thanks for watching to the end.